Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here talking to you today. I do remember back in 1981 was the first time I participated in the Topeka Model UN. And I was represented in Romania. And uh, I think, if nothing else, I have a definite appreciation for your perspective as a student trying to become engaged in this important learning process. I want you to think about something for a second. I want you to think what your life would be like if there was no oil. During this talk, I will touch on the political and economic impacts of oil and where we sit historically in terms of oil consumption and depletion. But first, a little about how I came to be here. In the middle of 2004, I went to a talk on post-war Iraq in San Francisco. The very next day, as I was walking into work, I saw a newspaper, a weekly newspaper, and the cover story was the end of oil. It had a little fuel gauge that was on empty. So I talked about this topic a little bit with my colleagues at work, and after that, did a little more research, and what I discovered troubled me quite a bit. So then I asked people I knew who I thought would know more about this topic than I did. I asked four different people with advanced degrees in the sciences. I asked them, what are we going to do about this issue? Why isn't the media talking more about this issue? And this is, should be of national importance, and I don't feel like anything, anyone is doing anything about it. What I found out in general was they didn't know any more than I did on the topic. And additionally, they thought that, in general, someone else who knows more about this problem is worrying about it and is going to solve it for us. And when I heard that from one person, I thought, okay. But when I heard a similar response from the second and the third person, I thought, wait a second. This is a topic that is hugely critical to everyone around the globe, and especially in the United States. And I don't feel like people are talking about it very much. And in general, they're saying someone else is probably taking care of this. So that's one thing that I would want you to take away from today's talk. Don't assume someone else is going to take care of you. Don't assume someone else higher up has a plan to solve everything. So my response to this issue was to leverage my talents as a graphic designer, and I worked with a writer to produce the poster that Liva mentioned. We created it because we feel people really need to become educated about the topic in order to make the best decisions moving forward. So now I want to quickly walk through some of the most salient points of the poster. Uh, I think we want to advance two slides. This graphic shows us where we are in the world. And I apologize, hopefully all of you can see this okay. It's a little off to the side, you'll have to crane your necks a little bit. So this graphic shows where oil is in the world. As you can see, the Middle East has the lion's share. Russia and Venezuela have pretty big chunks too. Nigeria and Libya each have more left than the United States has left. And there's a pretty good chunk if you add up all the other countries and put them over to the right there. So I'm sure plenty it, that you've heard plenty in the news in the, over the last year about oil. And I think this map help, helps to explain some of that. Next slide. We've seen prices going up. We've heard about hurricanes knocking out U.S. production. And we often hear news that is directly tied to violent flare-ups in countries like Nigeria, which is on the slide there. Um, also, tensions with Venezuela or the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. Next slide. This is the long view of energy consumption in the United States by energy type. You'll notice that wood was our primary fuel up till about 125 years ago. Since then, a quick succession of fossil fuels has kicked in. First we had coal, then purple, and then oil, then natural gas. 
So really, everyone alive today has been living during this time of huge growth in energy consumption. It's been an upslope for a couple of generations. And we pretty much take the growth for granted. But if you step back just a few more generations, you'll realize that we were using nothing more sophisticated than wood for fuel. And that had been the case for several thousand years of human civilization. The primary lesson here is that there's been a huge growth in a short amount of time. And this kind of growth is not business as usual for humankind. Now let's focus on oil production in the United States. A key thing to note about the United States is that the most explored, it is the most explored and developed oil region in the world. We were the first to become so. Up until about the mid-1960s, the U.S. was by far the world's largest oil producer. This graph shows the climb in U.S. oil production through the mid-1950s, and it's pretty much a steady upward slope. Next slide. In 1956, a geologist who worked for Shell's research labs, named Marion King Hubbard, predicted the U.S. would hit a production peak somewhere around 1970, and thereafter start a steady, unavoidable decline in oil production. Well, you might ask, how could he make such a prediction? The answer is that first, he had been in the oil industry long enough to know what the production life cycles of typical oil fields is. It's basically a bell curve. Oil fields, after a long upslope in production, eventually head the other way and go into terminal decline. He also understood that it took roughly 40 years to develop a field fully to peak production. So he basically combined that information with information about field discoveries. And so in 1956, here in the slide in red, is what discoveries there had been over the previous 85 years. You can see essentially discoveries peaked in 1930. So let's move forward to see how, to the present, to see how this prediction played out. He was dead on. The U.S. oil production peaked in 1970. So let's take a similar look at world production. Here we see world oil production since 1970. You notice there's a little dip in the early 1980s, which is the result of the 73 oil embargo and the 1979 Iranian cutoff of oil, which caused prices to go up and demand to go down. But as you can also see, we've pretty much picked up that production and continued it over the last 20 years. It's been pretty steady. Here's the worldwide discoveries in red again. It's kind of erratic, but the discoveries essentially peaked in the mid-1960s. Now, I should take a second here to note that this information is based on the best available data from oil industry experts, notably in this Association for the Study of Peak Oil. And these numbers specifically take into account that OPEC member nations artificially inflated their stated reserves in the mid-1980s. So based on Hubbard's methodology, where do you think we'll hit the peak? 2010? 2020? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. We're basically at peak now. Now, Some experts believe it'll happen this year. Others believe it'll be a few more years. The only way you really know is to actually have it happen and see it in hindsight. But this is very likely the view from the top. So if peak is now... What does that mean to you and me? Well, you might say, we're only halfway through all the oil, so we have another 100 years left. So why worry about it? 
The first thing you have to keep in mind is the latter half of oil will be more and more expensive to extract, more difficult to extract, and generally of poor quality. The second thing to remember is that everyone alive today in the U.S. and in most of the developed world is used to things going up and up. As demand outstrips supply and oil prices continue to rise, consumption will be forced to go down. So a vital question becomes whether economic growth can continue if energy consumption is declining. How will people and markets react? To better understand the implications of peak, we also have to understand why oil is so great and hard to replace. By comparison to other energy types, it takes an extremely low amount of energy to extract and process oil into usable fuel. In terms of energy returned on energy invested, conventional oil is 50, 50 times more profitable than ethanol. Additionally, oil is extremely energy dense and very easy to transport. That's why it's the overwhelmingly favorite source of fuel for cars, trucks, and jets. So back to our question of what does peak mean? I think it really means change more than anything else. We have to change how we behave, how much we consume, our expectations for growth, and our definition of happiness. The less we're able to change and adapt and adjust, the harder things will be. Because of the magnitude of our growth over the last 125 years, I think economic disruptions are likely. Keep in mind that we now have four times as many people on the planet than we did 125 years ago. I think social strife will increase because high-priced oil will hit the poor the hardest. Poor countries and poor people in rich countries. Transportation will become more expensive and less profitable. I wouldn't be surprised to see more airlines go out of business. Shipping and transportation costs will continue to rise with the price of oil, and that will have ripple effects throughout the world's economy, and especially here where we rely so much on long-haul trucking. Agriculture will be tougher because of how fossil fuel-intensive farming has become. And if we continue down our current road, resource wars will likely continue and broaden And that, I think, is the biggest immediate danger of peak oil. We've seen it with the conflict in Iraq specifically. We're not there solely because of weapons of mass destruction. We're not there solely because we want to see democracy flower in the Middle East. We are also there because of oil. And we've been hearing rumblings of a conflict with Iran because of their nuclear developments. It shouldn't surprise you. This is the last government in the Middle East with oil that is also unfriendly to the United States. And terrorism. We're not the targets of terrorism because of our freedoms and our cultural difference with the, with the Islamic world. The main source of terrorism is our policies and actions in the Middle East. We exert a huge amount of political and military influence in the region, largely because of our addiction to oil. And we're deeply resented for it. Okay, so let's switch gears a little and look at oil consumption from a global perspective. Before we show the slide, I want you to guess what percentage of the world's total oil production the United States consumes. And keep in mind, we're only 5% of the world's population. I'm not going to ask you to answer it. I just want you to have the number in your head. So let's go to the next slide. Here's consumption by country. Hopefully you can all read this. The United States is the large yellow-orange. It's astonishing. 
We are only 5% of the world's population, and yet we consume 25% of the world's oil. That's three times as much as the next largest consumer, which is China. We're like the kid at the pizza party eating all the pizza. (laughs) How long are we going to be able to keep our friends if we continue this behavior? It becomes a serious question, actually. Next slide. Here's another way of looking at it. This is how much oil is consumed per person per year, broken into the individual countries. And you'll see the United States, this is in barrels, um, and there are 42 gallons to a barrel. So on average, every man, woman, and child in the United States consumes the equivalent of three gallons of oil a day. We do it by the cars we drive, the food we consume, and the products we buy. For example, it takes three quarters of a gallon of oil to produce one pound of beef. Between all the costs of the machinery and the fertilizers to grow the corn, to feed the cattle, to make the beef. It takes seven gallons of oil to produce a tire. Since 1970, the number of miles traveled annually by U.S. cars and trucks has doubled. And recently, fuel economy has actually gone down with all of the SUVs and trucks on the road. To add insult to injury, we're also exporting our culture of consumption overseas through television, movies, and advertisements. The guys in China and India and everywhere else are being taught to consume just like we do. So at this point, I think it's terrifically important to ask how we got here. And I think in a lot of ways you can boil it down to the dynamic duo of free market capitalism and abundant cheap energy in the form of oil and other fossil fuels. It has produced a society based on consumption and growth. Growth is good. Self-interested corporations of all stripes have been shaping our culture and our laws and our government to improve profits by increasing our consumption. And it started with car companies, oil companies, tire and rubber companies, and construction companies. It has since expanded to all areas of our economy. The more we buy, the more we eat, the more we watch, the more we consume, the better. And we've all bought into it because it's a powerful, controlling process. Just think about it. Everywhere you turn, there's an ad telling you that you'll feel better if you just consume more. So if you can't consume as much as your parents did, do you think you'll be less happy? Think about it. Well, here's a, there's actually some good news that I want to end on. <laughs> Contrary to what corporations want you to think, increasing consumption does not increase happiness. Next slide, okay. Since 1957, the average U.S. income has more than doubled. This chart shows from 1955 to 2005. We have twice as many cars per person. We eat out two and a half times as often. And in in the late 1950s, few Americans had dishwashers, clothes dryers, TVs, or air conditioning. Today, most of us do. During the same period, the number of Americans who say they are very happy has actually declined. 35% to 32%. So this is saying that once you have your basic needs covered, money and consumption can't buy you any more happiness. And that is a huge life lesson for all of us. I think a lot of people don't want you to hear it for obvious reasons. So I'll repeat it. Once your basic needs are covered, 
Money and consumption cannot buy you more happiness. What our lives need more of today is a sense of purpose, a sense of connection with each other, and a sense of civility. And in that sense, the end of oil could actually mean the beginning of something better. Thank you.